Hey, how you doing? It's Clayton here from HowToDrawComics.net. In this video, I'm going to be showing you a drawing demonstration that uh, will be featuring a concept, another concept actually, that I've created for Rob Arnold's Replicator comic book. This is and has been a really, really fun project to work on with Rob. And uh, I got to say that this particular character did give me a little bit of trouble, however, even though initially I thought she was going to be kind of easy. Now, her name is Ghost, and she's supposed to be this kind of ninja assassin type chick. I actually don't know a whole lot about her, but essentially the brief, which is usually pretty brief with Rob, uh, which is great, of course, because it gives me a lot of creative freedom, is just that she needed a, a cool looking helmet and some kind of skin tight get up to get around in because of course she's a ninja assassin so she's going to have that mobility available to her. So the first thing I tackled with this particular concept was the helmet because I felt that that was the most important and it was going to require the most amount of attention to design. Um, you know, being the head of the character, it's the first point of contact that the viewer was going to get in terms of being able to take it in, it leaves the strongest impression. It's the part of the character that everybody kind of looks to first to relate with. However, in this particular situation, because the character is wearing a helmet, they're still going to, of course, have their eyes travel to that point first and foremost, as far as the audience is concerned. But at the same time, they're not going to be able to necessarily relate with this particular character in the same way that they would any other character that had their face revealed. Because, of course, a character that actually has facial features that you can see expressing is going to be much more easier to relate with on an emotional level than a character who has their face covered. That's often why uh, comic book characters, in fact, uh, a little bit more mysterious, maybe, and a little bit more intimidating. You know, if you're taking characters like Batman, for example, whose face is partly covered, you can't necessarily get a clear read on exactly how they're feeling, what their emotional state is. And so these characters tend to make you feel a little bit, I guess, less comfortable, less confident in exactly, you know, wh where they're coming from. Are they a good guy? Are they a bad guy? Are they angry? Are they happy? Are they sad? Are they mad? And uh, so it can be a little bit disconcerting for us as the viewer because our way of connecting with anybody is to be able to connect with them on that emotional level. And the more that we're able to do that, the more familiar they feel to us, the, the safer we feel because you know, all of a sudden what's going on inside of that character is revealed on the surface. And when we've got that level of transparency that we're able to kind of latch onto with a character, that allows us to understand them and to kind of put ourselves in their shoes a little bit more. I mean, that's the whole deal with relating with a character. And so this particular character being a bad guy, oh, actually, I don't know if this character is a bad guy, could be a good guy. Rob didn't give me the lowdown on that necessarily, which in hindsight would have been good because villains tend to give off a, a significantly different vibe than a hero or a protagonist, as opposed to an antagonist and what have you. Um, but I think I just assumed that this character was a bad guy for one reason or another. So, uh, you know, I mean, being an assassin ninja, you'd kind of assume that she's uh, probably not uh, the, 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 the kindest character necessarily. So uh, I decided to go that route and come up with a design here for the helmets that was somewhat kind of scary looking, I guess, to look at. So I wanted to implement... Um, a face that was completely covered in its, in its entirety so that, uh, you know, there was no tells or giveaways as to what that character looked like, uh, much less what they were feeling, um, much less uh, their emotional state. Because when you can, when a character can keep their cards close to their chest in that way, it gives them much more power in terms of you know, where they're at as opposed to the other characters within the book that may be giving away a lot as to what is going on inside their head, across their face, through the expression of their facial features. 
So, you know, this is getting into more design territory and what you might want to keep in mind when it does come to designing comic book characters, especially in terms of villains or especially anti-heroes as well. Uh, Spider-Man is probably another comic book character, actually, where you can't really tell what's going on with his face because it's completely covered in a, you know, Spider-Man patterned balaclava of some kind. And it could be the way in which we have related, uh, you know, balaclavas to bad guys in society as well. You know, people who tend to have their faces covered up are hiding something. They're usually dangerous people in one form or another. Even it wasn't that, wasn't that long ago that people with beards were also kind of, you know, this guy looks or comes across a little bit shady. You know, that's oftentimes where you see uh, businessmen with their faces most of the time, at least once upon a time, completely shaved so that you know, there was nothing to hide there underneath their face. Um, you could see them in a bit more of a clearer light. So this stuff plays into design in a big way. And especially when you're talking about a character like this, where you've got a ninja assassin type character, super secretive, you know, identity hidden, um, probably never wants to have their identity revealed in any capacity. They're going to be completely covered up. And that makes them much more intimidating for us as the viewer, which is exactly what you want if indeed they are a villain or even an anti-hero, such as Spawn, for example. That's another great example there where you've got a character completely covered in a mask. Now, for the overall design of the character, you know, not just the helmet, but their entire body, what I decided to do initially was kind of sketch up a bit of a pose here, as you can see on the screen in front of you, but I didn't ultimately end up going with this pose. And this is where I started running into trouble because I wasn't entirely happy with the direction that the design was going in for one reason or another. If I think back as to why I wasn't entirely happy with it, I think that the character just wasn't giving off the right vibe for me. They didn't uh, look the way that I wanted them to look. But even more than that, again, that, that undercurrent of energy, of personality, just wasn't expressed through their stance, uh, through the way in which the character was presented as far as their body language. And so I, as I was drawing this up, I decided to try to fix that and to overcompensate because of that in a way where I decided to try to rejig the pose a little bit and rework it until hopefully by chance I was able to get to the point where that level of expression and personality within the character was ultimately coming through. Now there was also a, a possibly a few technical problems as well. I wasn't entirely confident with how the legs were looking, how she was balanced, especially here. You can see me trying out different leg poses. The initial leg poses that I had was just kind of boring to look at. There wasn't a whole lot of energy there. It was static and uh, fairly generic. So I wanted to change that up, see if I could pick a pose for the character's legs that would get who they were coming through a little bit more just to make them look alive. The last thing you want with your character designs is a shell of a character that doesn't really have anything going for it you know it's just uh it's essentially a halloween costume sitting on top of a mannequin and you want to try to avoid that effect as much as you possibly can because if you aren't able to do that you'll have great looking visuals but you won't have any personality within the character coming through they won't appear to have i call it a soul you know, I think that that's the best way to describe it is to think of your characters as having a soul, as being alive, and then trying to get that to come through, come across to the viewer on the page. This is a very hard and nuanced thing to do. It's certainly not easy, and it takes years and years of experience to really get that that life energy, if you will, to come through within a drawing because it's much more than just a, a static character then. It becomes much more than about getting the character's proportions correct or the anatomy accurate. It goes beyond that. It goes underneath all of that and uh, right back down to the foundations where you're initially establishing the overall pose and gesture of the character. 
I believe that that's really where the life of the character is conceived, essentially, because everything is built on top of that. So I try to incorporate as much gesture into my character's pose as I possibly can in the beginning, because if I can do that and I can at least maintain it, despite the fact that it's you know, ultimately going to uh, stiffen up as I refine it, then it'll mean that I'm able to carry it all the way through to the end and hopefully maintain that liveliness and have it come through in the character when it's finally refined and, and polished up in its final presentation. So this is something that I've found has become a high priority for me as uh, over the years I've kind of developed my abilities and my skill set. You know, in the beginning, it was most definitely about figuring out how to make sure that my characters were in proportion, getting them to look right on the technical level, you know, making sure the muscles were placed and scaled accurately in relation to one another. But then after I kind of mastered that, Oh, well, actually, you know, I, I I hesitate to use the word mastering because it's, uh, it's a strong word to use for an artist to say that they've mastered anything, really, because this is one of those areas, one of those crafts where there's always room for improvement, and that's just the reality of the situation. Um, but... After I had become comfortable and I guess you could say confident with anatomy and proportions, I decided that, hey, you know what? The next thing that I need to focus on is is really breathing a bit of life into these characters. And so here with the second pose, you'll notice that I just erased all the work that I did and I started again from scratch. I highly encourage you to do the same thing as well. Don't grow too attached to your work. It depends, of course, as to whether or not you do that and how often you do that because we do have deadlines and sometimes we don't have the time to restart something that we've been working on for hours and it had been a good few hours for me working on this character before I decided to completely redo her pose and and start all over again. I thought it was worth it though because, you know, this is uh, this is for Rob's comic book uh, replicator and I I know that this character is going to take on a life within that book, within that narrative. And knowing that, knowing that it just doesn't end here with this character and that she will live on in the pages of his comic book, it kind of makes me want to invest that time and that energy. Even if I have to, you know, really put that, go that extra mile with the character to just get her to look right. Uh, It's totally worth it for me because... As a concept designer, where you're actually deciding on the look for a character, you have to remember that that is the look that that character is going to have from the moment you hand that concept over. And uh, it may be adjusted and it may change over time, you know, as other artists interpret the design in their own way. But you are, for the most part, responsible for how this character is going to look when you send them out into their own little comic book world. So I wanted to make sure that Again, I did this character justice for Rob, and uh, so it was worth the investment of time on this one. And I think that the end product was, to- you know, looking at that, it was totally worth that extra time that I put into it. And it always is. I don't think that you ever leave a concept or a drawing or an illustration or any body of work that you've worked on where you've had to go back and redo it a few times and do massive changes to it. I think it's always for the better. You know, you you never regret that additional time that you've spent to fix it up because in the end, that final presentation is really what everything is going to amount to, what all your energy and time that you've invested thus far is going to amount to. So if you have to spend an extra hour just refining it, perfecting it and polishing it up, then why not? Totally go for that. It's worth it if you've already put, you know, hours and hours into it thus far. Why not take it all the way? That's the way I see it anyway. Of course, I did promise Rob that I'd get it done at the end of the week, which, you know, I, I almost did. I got it done on Sunday, but uh, it was past 12 o'clock on Sunday, so it was actually Monday. But, uh, 
Yeah, and he's in Australia as well with me, so it would have been Monday morning for him as well, which means I was a little bit late on this one. But that's okay because, you know, he got to wake up to an email from me in the morning and uh, containing this concept, and hopefully it, it set him off to a good start for the day. But now that the pose for this this new pose for the character has been established, I'm trying to figure out what direction I'm going to go on for this helmet again. This helmet really gave me a lot of trouble because I just, for some reason or another, as easy as I thought it was going to be, couldn't figure it out. So I had asked Rob, you know, look, I showed him the these sketches over here to the right of the helmet designs that I had come up with, and I asked him for his opinion, you know, what what which one of these helmets are working best for you? And he told me which one he, he liked the most. And so I decided to go for that one. It wasn't the first choice that I would have picked, but uh, I thought, hey, you know, this is uh, Rob's character, so uh, why not? And it turned out that I think I liked his choice a little bit better in the end. So I reworked that helmet a little bit and uh, tried to make it so that I could fit it onto the the character's body um, as best I could. A lot of the time with concept design, when you've got to depict how a character is going to look from different angles, you have to fit and put together the design uh, from those angles. You have to try and interpret it from those different points of view. That can be really difficult because essentially what you need to do at that point is really try to understand that design on a three-dimensional level. Um, and if you're not used to doing that, if you're new to dynamic drawing in general, and you've only really kind of had experience drawing 2D images, you know, in other words, just drawing characters from the side and, and the front, which we most of us start off doing, I think, as aspiring artists. Um, eventually, we graduate to the more dynamic points of view, such as the three-quarter view, classic three-quarter view. That's probably the next view that we learn how to draw effectively and then we start drawing it from all sorts of different angles you know figures from in this pose and that pose from that in that perspective and this perspective that takes a lot of time though and it takes a uh, your brain needs time to figure out how to function in that way to be able to take a 2d image convert it to a 3d model inside your mind and then project it back down onto the page or rather construct it back down onto the page and so this was something that I had to do with this very complex helmet design that I'd created for this character Ghost and the other thing that I needed to consider is that it actually needs to look good from these points of view as well which means if I draw it up and it looks badass from the side view here I've got to go back and rework the three-quarter view if it isn't exactly the same. And I might make, you know, small tweaks here and there. But what I'm trying to say here is that when you're dealing with multiple views of the same concept and you're in that design stage, you're kind of designing them all at once. It's not like you just design the front view and then you've got the side view ready to go from there, you know, and you're just working off the side view and that's it. No, you're kind of, you're working on both at the same time. So that's something that uh, I find very fun to do, but it's also difficult. It's fun in the way that it's it's kind of like a big puzzle. You're trying to figure out not just where each piece fits, but what shape each piece should be at the same time. Um, so I think of it kind of like a, a model aeroplane almost. So if we take the concept of the model aeroplane and we convert it into a model helmet here, I'm figuring out, okay, how does each piece need to fit together? Where does it go? And I'm kind of using the, uh, the three-quarter view as a reference as I design the side view there. And then here, I'm going to do up a back view of the character so that I know what this helmet looks like from behind and what her overall body is going to look like from behind as well. Because in a comic book especially, this character is going to be born, uh, well, sorry, <laughs> born, uh, drawn from multiple different angles, an endless amount of angles and, and points of view. 
So really, I mean, the more illustrations that I can create here of this character in the design phase, the better for the comic book artists who will ultimately illustrate the, the replicated comic book, or the, the third issue of the replicated comic book, I should say. And uh, Rob has found an artist, I believe he's been talking to an artist, whose artwork looks very, very stunning. So I think that they're going to be able to do a lot of magical stuff with the concepts for the characters that I've created here for the Replicator comic book. And I'm looking forward to it. You know, I think it's very rewarding, especially for a com uh, concept artist, when they can see their concepts come to life in a comic book, in a movie or a video game. You know, before I was really focused in on comics, I did a lot of work in video games and creating video game concepts for characters and environments was one of my most favorite things to do. Um, it's just as fun as doing them for comic books, in fact. And I gotta imagine that movies is the same, even though I haven't really done any concept for movies before. But I really enjoy character design and I think it's because you're able to create this character from nothing, just purely from your imagination. They didn't exist before, and you get to design how they're going to look. And they're going to, to act out this story. They're going to go on adventures. They're going to make friends. And they're going to be part of this completely fictional world that you've helped design the look of. And... Uh, for me, that's just really, really cool. Like, that's kind of why, what creativity means to me at the end of the day. If you can create something and it's not just a created, like, static image that you're looking at at the end, but it goes and it lives on within some other form, within a comic book, within a movie, within a video game, that is just so meaningful. I mean, that's giving your work a whole new life. Uh, it, it allows it to not just stop at that final image, but to continue on and, and see it become something else entirely. So I've got the basic sketches down, and now is the moment in time where I'm going to go over the top of all those sketches and start to articulate the details. And this is one of my most favorite parts of the entire process, because all the hard thinking is done at this point. And it means that I'm able to focus just on the drawing aspect. You know, I don't have to kind of make, you know, do these mathematical gymnastics inside my brain and, and try to figure out, you know, whether or not everything is in proportion and, you know, how the design is necessarily going to look. I'm just kind of going over the top and I'm refining what's there, which is, it's just so cool because it means that I can switch on some music and chill out and just work away until the artwork is done. And also on top of it, this is where you really start to see the work you've done become solidified. And you start to see it actually look cool as you drop in the line weights and the rendering. And you start to describe the forms of the concept. It begins to pop and it starts to look like something that... That's actually that could actually exist. It's not just a sketch anymore. It is really interesting, though, just how many people love this the sketching stage um, in terms of the audience. For some reason or another, polished artwork does just as good as sketched artwork, um, and I think that it's because the audience likes to feel like they're a part of the process. So. When they can feel like they're a part of the process, they're connecting with it on a whole new level. They actually are able to get a deeper look at what went into this illustration. And uh, when they can see that, they can know it in a different way. They can know it a little bit better. Um, they get that perspective that the artist had while they were creating it. Uh, they get an inside look into that creation process. So now what I'm doing is I'm looking at the side view of the character's helmet and I'm going over to the three-quarter view of the character's helmet, and I'm rejigging various aspects of it slightly. You know, the shape of the back of the helmet, and, you know, I'm dropping in the, the little kind of that sharp fang-like uh, piece of metal on the side bottom of the helmet there as well, trying to get that to look correct in the perspective that I'm presenting the head on here. And the 
the kicker is, is that it needs to look exactly like the side view would look if it was turned in a three-quarter perspective, right? So you're creating the suggestion that we're taking the same concept here, the same image, and we're kind of turning it a little bit to view it at the three-quarter view. Now, this is kind of difficult to do because um, it, it is, it's totally a guesstimation, right? Like there's, there's no... Uh, there's no equation here that you could follow and wind out with the exact correct 100% uh, you know accurate representation of how that side view is going to look in the three-quarter view it's all a guessing game and the more experienced you get the better you get at guessing how it should look but it'll never be 100% accurate um, I'm not going to get out my my ruler and start to measure this stuff up and and go to that extent. And even if I did, it would make the image look so static and so lifeless, and it it really wouldn't end up looking any better. In fact, it would probably look much more flat, and it would lose its uh it the the appeal that uh, genuine creativity just kind of brings to the table. You know, I like to go with the flow a little bit when I'm creating these concepts. When I'm drawing anything, I like to go with the flow a little bit, especially now that I'm at the point where I don't have to analyze it as much anymore. So I think, you know, in the end, you've, uh, you've got to let go to an extent of that perfectionism and that took me a long time, a very long time to completely let go of. I still struggle with it to an extent, but it's only to an extent. You know, I don't struggle with everything. I don't need to make everything perfect, only the major things. And so, you know, you will see me going back and, and readjusting the shape of the helmet uh, multiple times and, and really trying to get that to look right. Well, at the same time, trying to get it to look good. You know, it's got to look accurate, of course, according to the design sketch that I've already done for the side view of it, but it's also got to look great from this angle. And so, you know, it's always a balance. And, and that's kind of what I'm measuring the drawing against. I'm measuring it against those variables, you know, whether or not it looks accurate, whether they, they these two viewpoints are consistent with one another. I certainly don't want to draw a helmet here that looks like a completely different helmet. It's got to look like the same helmet, just turned and viewed at a different angle. Um, and then the other thing that I'm measuring it against is, okay, well, does it look good from this angle? And does some adjustments need to be made here? Um, and then, of course, you've got the other technical aspects, which at this point... You know, things like perspective and, and form and, and that kind of thing, it's become part of my own artistic intuition. And I know that seems very, uh, <laughs> um, it seems like I'm, I'm speaking highly of myself there, you know, like I've done this so much that it's just become part of my artistic intuition. I'm not, I'm not trying to have myself come across in that way. I'm just, I think, I, I want to say that once you practice this stuff enough, those fundamentals do kind of just become part of your process and you don't have to think about them that much anymore. They don't bother you as much. And the cool part is, is that the more you let go and I don't want to say don't care as much, but it does feel like you're not, you're not as concerned with those aspects of the drawing as you may have been once upon a time. You tend to find that the artwork ends up turning out better the less you think about it. And I've certainly found that with my own artwork, that when I can really just clear my head and let my hand go, just go free on the page, a lot of the time the artwork that, that manifests on the page is really a surprise to me. Um, and I'll have these moments where I, I'm i so surprised that I'm like, hey, wait a second, how did I get that on the page like how how did i i didn't even know that i knew how to do that you know and it's almost intimidating to look at the finished result and then realize that damn like the next time i put pencil to paper i'm gonna have to try to measure up to the standard of work that i've just done here and i don't even really know 100 percent how i did it because 
I'm a very analytical person. So the way in which I initially learned how to draw was, you know, I took this very analytical approach. I knew that if I understood the fundamentals, I'd be A-OK. All it was was a matter of practice. So I took the time to learning the fundamentals. I did my perspective studies. I did my figure drawing studies. I studied form. I studied lighting. I did a lot of rendering. And uh, every time I did these exercises, they were very, uh, you know, okay, here's the instruction booklet, here's what the instructions say, replicate what the instructions are saying, get the result that you're supposed to get from following the instructions. And, you know, the more that I practiced it, the more that result would somewhat resemble what I was supposed to be trying to achieve on the page. And uh, that was great. It wasn't really, I felt for a long time that I wasn't really in the artistic zone. I wasn't really in the creative zone. I was constantly in this analytical rut where I was just kind of, uh, you know, really deeply judging (laughs) whether or not I had these fundamentals handled um, and whether or not the drawing adhered to them. So, you know, it uh, it was a time in my artistic journey where I was enjoying the process and I was enjoying the process of getting better but it wasn't really until this point in time you know after man how long have I been drawing for now quite a while I have to say I've always drawn I've always been interested in uh, comic book art especially you know I remember being back in primary school when uh, you know one of my friends uh, he bought a no actually it might have been high school he bought a calendar to school of uh, Louis Royo and I was just, I fell in love with that artwork straight away. I'm like, man, what, who's this artist? Where did you get it? Because um, I wanted it as well. I, would, I, think I, I think I asked him, can, can I have this? Do you mind if I have this? You know, because I was just so taken back by it. So I was really always into this stuff. And because I was into it, I was inspired to draw it as best I could with the skills that I had available to me. Um, And that's really what pushed me and what drove me to keep on going despite the the flaws that uh, I encountered endlessly within my work and to ultimately get to the point that I'm at today. But that took uh, decades, I would say. Um, You know, probably I got serious in 20, uh, well, I would have been 16, so that would have been 2006. So I guess, uh, you know, a good 12 years of really putting my head down and and studying this stuff to get to the point where I'm at now where I can just kind of draw away and not be too anxious, not to be too stressed about it, not turning out the way that I intend it to turn out. You know, when you're first drawing and you think it looks really good, but then you, uh, You come back and you look at it like 10 minutes later and it's all out of whack. Like the proportions are are super crazy and like the the anatomy is just completely flawed. Um, That doesn't really happen to me that much anymore. It used to, but it doesn't. You know, I kind of catch it on the fly as I'm constructing the artwork now, which is really, really awesome. And uh, I'm not just trying to brag here, but, you know, even though it sounds like I might be, What I'm trying to say, though, is that as you practice yourself and as you go through the same trials and tribulations that every artist, including myself, has to go through, you got to have faith that you're going to get to this point where this is how it's going to be for you as well. Like, eventually, you'll... You won't have to think about those fundamentals anymore. You won't have to uh, worry about, you know, coming back 10 minutes later and and realizing your artwork is completely out of whack because you're looking at it with that fresh perspective. Um, it'll, It'll turn out cool and you'll be able to focus more on the creation side of things as a result rather than, you know, whether or not it's technically correct. It'll be more hey, is this a cool design? Is the character's personality coming through here? It'll be kind of on that that other uh, level of uh, artistic expression. It won't really be the tools anymore and the technical things that make the drawing work structurally. It'll be the concept itself, you know, uh, the composition, 
and that kind of thing. And you just you, you got to have faith that although this journey is really long and and it takes years and years and years to get good, that if it really matters to you and you stick with it as a result, because it does matter so much to you, you will get to the point where your art looks really great. You're happy with it. When I say your art looks really great, I mean that you know you're satisfied with how it looks. I think that that should be the aim that all of us should be tr- striving for: is just Can we get our artwork to the point where we think it looks cool, where we're creating the kind of stuff that we would have seen other artists creating and became so inspired that we decided to pursue this journey in the first place? Because I think that that's really what pushes me to keep on going. You know, like I'm inspired by other people's work. And I think that the result of that inspiration is always me trying to up my game to that next level, trying out new things. And, you know, if I see an artist who's rendered something in a really interesting way, or, uh, you know, they got an, uh, for me, uh, it's rendering at the moment. Like I always admired artists like Bernie Wrightson and, you know, the, the really old comics actually from, you know, back in the, the late eighties and, not so much the 90s even, just the, the 80s when it was just black and white, white line work on the page and really all you had there to suggest form was rendering and lots of cross-hatching. You know, I've, I've been looking at artwork like that and I've got to say that it's really making me want to up my game with rendering. And as you can see, that's very evident here in the character that I'm creating. It's probably more detailed than I would normally do. And uh, I've actually had quite an interesting experience over the last year, I would say. I've noticed that my art has really kind of taken a new direction, especially as far as rendering goes. It's it's strange. It's like something has taken over, to be honest. Um, <laughs> some I've been possessed by some other artist who just knows uh, how to render better than I used to be able to render. That's how it feels. You know, because all this rendering that I'm placing in now around the character's body, I just kind of place that in really naturally. I'm not concerned about it. I'm not thinking about it too much. I'm just really hoping that I can create the uh, the illusion of form here and that I can describe the anatomy uh, in a way which uh, looks great and is consistent with the light source and, you know, has a cool style to it. I used to be really, really intimidated to add any rendering into my artwork whatsoever. I always stressed out about it. I didn't know where to place the shadows or how to depict the anatomy. And all of a sudden, they just reached this point. And I I guess it's kind of like that curve, right? Like you're so stressed about learning it and you're struggling for so long. And then one day you just wake up and all of a sudden you know how to do it. It's like this this moment in time where all the investment that you put in and the, the energy that you put in to actually overcoming the drawbacks within your work, the things that challenge you the most, it pays off and you're all of a sudden you're able to do it. And I feel like that I've reached that point and I'm just really, really happy about that because it means that I can focus less on that particular aspect within my art and I'm able to, to focus on the stuff that, that really drives me, which is actually creating it in the first place, the, the creative part. I'm, I'm really loving being able to enjoy that now because, yeah, for, and I'm sure you can relate if you're watching this video. You know, you're, you're watching this video because you want to get some tips and tricks and some sort of insight out of watching this video and, and hopefully being able to apply that to your own work. Um, but you're in that phase right now within your artistic development where you're, you're striving to get good and you're striving to overcome the challenges that might be holding you back. And it depends at what level you're at, of course, as to what those challenges are going to be. But, uh, I got to say that I had a lot of them before I got to this point and it was motivation that really kept me going. It wasn't the enjoyment of it. It was just the, the motivation to get better. And I think that you have to look at it like a fun video game that uh, that is challenging, you know? Like, games are fun because they, they have some level of challenge associated with them. 
if they were easy, then we wouldn't want to play them. They wouldn't be fun at all. It'd just be, you know, passing the time, uh, you know, kicking a rock along the ground, basically. But, uh, you know, drawing is the same in a sense. You know, I'm not, I think, yeah, as I said, the, the challenge for me right now, what, what keeps me going, what keeps me kind of hooked in and engaged with my artwork is is the challenges that I face more on a creative level. Um, it's really fun to try to, to present the character in a way that looks interesting. Like, you'll notice that I wasn't quite concerned with the proportions of this character, but I was concerned with their pose and whether or not that pose was kind of presenting them and, and bringing them across in the right way to you as the viewer. And so I did have fun, like, rejigging that and trying to work it out. I mean, it comes, comes to a point where... Um, that can get tedious and annoying, especially when you've attempted to do that pose like 10 times, let's say, um, then you just want to, you've had enough and you just want to kind of get it over and done with. Um, but usually I'll find myself, uh, every now and then there'll be a character where I just, I got to start from scratch because it just wasn't going in the direction that I wanted it to go in. And I think that's why it's really, really important to make sure that you only start the rendering stage and the line waiting stage and all the, the intricate details that you're seeing me put in here after you're 100% confident that everything that you've done up until that point, the pose, the anatomy, the proportions of the character, the overall rough design of the character is 100% solid because you certainly don't want to erase it at this point. You know, there's been hours put in. And it'd be like starting again. Uh, there's just not enough time in the day to to waste it doing that stuff. So you kind of have to build it up in a strategic way, your drawings. You have to make sure that you're considerate of the workflow and, and what's going to be the most optimized approach for you as an artist. Uh, because, yeah, you can waste a lot of time on an, on an artwork if... That, that is just unneeded. You don't need to waste that much time. Um, sure, you're going to make mistakes and you're going to inevitably rejig it. You're, you're always going to make mistakes. No matter what level you get to, you're never going to get to the point where everything just runs smoothly. Uh, I always have to use, pull the eraser out at some point within these illustrations and i gotta, I got to rejig it. But uh, that's okay. That's completely fine. That's supposed to happen. However, if you find that you're spending an unneeded amount of time fixing stuff up, uh, that's that might be a workflow issue. That might just be that you're getting it the wrong way around. You know, you're following through on a flawed pose, a flawed uh, character design, and you're taking it all the way through to the end when you should have stopped earlier on and kind of looked at the artwork with a critical eye, with an honest eye, and kind of made the adjustments that you needed to make before you took it too far. And developing that eye takes time as well. Again, it, it's going to take a little while to, to get to the point where you're able to kind of make these judgments on the fly. So you have to figure out how you're going to motivate yourself in in order to, to continue onward and for me, it was just the self-belief and the, and the confidence that, hey, eventually, if I just kept on doing what I was doing, I would get to a point where I was able to to create what you're seeing here. You know, and I'm still growing, of course. I've still got a lot of growing to do. Um, I'm great at doing characters. Uh, sequentials, I, I feel like, you know, I've always had a knack, but I haven't done a whole lot of them. So when I start getting into more sequential work, which I ultimately will do, it'll be very interesting for me. Uh, to see exactly what challenges I'm going to come up against with that, because I can guarantee you I'm going to come up against a ton of challenges. It'll then then we'll be really talking about storytelling and and whether or not the narrative is flowing well visually in a way which is understandable to the audience. And then you've got to consider, you know, the placement of the characters and and their poses on an even more extreme level. You know, you're looking at a character design here, which is in a fairly static pose. You know, there's a bit of personality coming through, of course. Just the right amount of personality needed in order to kind of give the audience an idea as to who this character might be. And their kind of temperament, <clears throat> their attitude and what have you. But in a comic book where you're actually trying to show a narrative, not tell, 
You should never have to leave the uh, the dialogue up to explaining what's happening within the story. The audience should just get it. They should be able to look at the visual sequence of images that you put together and understand exactly what is happening within that story. So, you know, th- there's always room to grow for everybody, including myself, and I'm looking forward to it, to be quite frank, and hopefully you are as well, because there's always more fun to be had with this stuff. Uh, you know, there's the enjoyable aspects of it, but I think... of the time, that joy is going to come from the challenges that you have to go through and that you have to face. If you're an impatient person, comic book art is probably not for you. You know, being a comic book artist means that you're going to have to take it easy on yourself, know that you will fail, but that you'll be able to pick yourself back up in the, the face of failure, hopefully, and keep on going. But if you don't have that patience and and that ability to always be humble with your work, look at it with a humble eye and understand that, hey, there's always going to be someone out there better than you. That's the the truth of life that I can tell you is that there's always going to be an artist better than you. There's always going to be someone taller than you. There's always going to be someone, (laughs) you know, more uh, jacked up than you. There's always going to be someone who's a better singer, have more Instagram followers. There's always going to be someone better. Um, but, you know, you you just got to kind of follow your own journey and, and understand that it's going to be littered, absolutely littered with challenges that you'll grow through each and every time. So now I'm working on the back of the character, and this is really the final sketch that I've done up for this concept. I gotta admit here that I think I probably went a little bit too overboard on the detailing for the back view of the character. Um, you know, I was getting a bit carried away with the hatches there, and uh, I thought that the front turned out really cool, so I wanted to try to have that come through in the back view as well, but. Um, you know, you don't want to ever place too much detail onto a character that it ultimately ends up kind of taking over and overwhelming the drawing to the extent where you just can't see what's happening anymore. You can't see beyond that detail. It kind of becomes the center of attention and uh, takes the focus away from really what you're trying to present overall with the idea. So, it's important to really gauge that and it's something that I've always really tried to hold myself to and be responsible with. I think that knowing how to use cross hatches in order to render form isn't that hard to learn. What's hard to learn is how to balance it all out, how to uh, leave it out sometimes completely. And I can tell you that it's very easy to over render a character. It does not take a lot um, you can see me there trying to you know, add in a little bit more form around the buttocks of the character, uh, taking it out where it's not needed and kind of reassessing the back here, the lower back, as I try to re-suggest uh, the forms with the hatches that I've placed in there. You know, it's it's always a situation where at times I'm trying things out, not necessarily because, you know, it's intended that that I'm going to include that within the illustration, but I just want to see if whether or not it works. So I'll experiment um, sometimes needlessly just to see whether or not what I'm doing is going to add to the artwork or take away from it. So don't be afraid to experiment. You know, everyone's got an eraser. You can just pull it out if worse comes to worse. Uh, make sure that you're constantly saving your work so that if you really mess up, you can go back to a previously saved version of it and kind of, you know, rework it from there but don't be afraid Um, you're a creator you're supposed to experiment that's what creativity is all about is is coming up with something new and interesting and the only way to do that is to you know go outside your comfort zone every now and then and and try to experiment a little bit with uh, things and and subject matter with with shapes and lines and uh, rendering that you've never necessarily uh, explored as much before. So, uh, you know, it's it's about being brave a lot of the time. And, and what you'll find is when you can be brave, 
you'll come up with some of the best work and y- there's no way that you would have done it if you weren't daring enough. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's got to be priorities. When you're first starting out, your priorities are going to be very different to your priorities later on down the track when you've got a handle on those fundamentals and the basic drawing principles. They will be less of a priority and it'll be more about experimenting later on, as I'm as I'm saying here. You know, it'll be more about seeing how far you can bend the rules that you've learned for all those years, you know, and uh, and how far you can push yourself as an artist because across your lifetime, there's just such a potential of things that you can create once you learn how to do this stuff. And sometimes I sit back and I think about the body of work that I'm going to create over my lifetime and, uh, and the kind of things that I would like to kind of draw out onto the page and what those things will be, what they will look like. And uh, it, it kind of gives me a buzz, you know, it gets me excited. So I hope that you enjoyed this demonstration. I had a lot of fun creating it for Rob. It was uh, super awesome to put together for him, as many of these uh, concept commissions often are. If you haven't seen the previous one, uh, go back through the video library and check out the pain concept because uh, this is from the same comic book series, Replicator, uh, that'll be coming out. Uh, these characters we featured in issue three, so I'm really looking forward to it. Probably won't be for a while. But I hope that you enjoyed this video. Thanks so much for watching. I hope that it inspired you, that you got some insight out of it. Until next time, keep on creating, keep on practicing, and I'll see you in the next video.